Hello and welcome back to the Risen Pre-Made Unstoppable, where we're watching Omega Gaming Lunar play against Demon Slayers. We saw in, Ome in uh, Game 1, Omega Gaming Lunar crushed the game convincingly, uh, piloting Le Echo that we see banned right now in the mid lane to a very nice, well-rounded victory. Yep, yeah, exactly, Diatch Pro. Ladies and gentlemen, that is that is how you do an introduction, by the way, might I say. Uh, we'll ignore my scuffed <laughs> game number one one. Uh, very well played. I'm Rudu, uh, joined by Diatch Pro here. The one thing you missed out. I'll, That's I'll... the one thing. As soon as I said it, I knew. <laughs> I'll call you out for that one. But anyway, we are we are into this uh, game number two draft here. Uh, oh, here we go. We've got the Echo Ban away, which we alluded to. GP still available if, if Luna wants it, but... Um, I don't expect that to come through because I'd rather see Demon Slayers get to the second round of bans and, and ban that away. Um, that depends, though. There's always a world where Luna take GP in the first phase, if they're feeling that confident in the blind pick. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, it is going to be with Ash and Caitlyn both banned away, by the way. Some uh, interesting AD carry adjustments. The Ezreal and the Aphelio. So we're going back a couple of patches here. We're going back to uh, Ezreal ADC, Aphelios ADC, the fun lanes, you know, the corky Azir of bot lane right here uh, with the Graves picks up in the jungle as well. Yeah, and there's the chance that we even see a Yumi pickup from OGL later in this draft if it does get through. <clears throat> I think it's really interesting that we saw the, the two... The two AD carries, regardless of who won from game one, were banned. Nobody had fun in that lane. Uh, but it looks <laughs> like the Bard could be the pickup for Omega Gaming Lunar. Um, as we did see Scarred Rabble playing very well, finding some really nice cosmic bindings in order to get some er early advantages in the lane. Yeah, you know, Tempered Fates were on point as well. Uh, just overall, really nice Bard play coming through from, from Rabble here. Um, and I, I, t I alluded to it earlier, the, the Gangplank Bind pick was a potential option for them, and Etherno picks it up before they get it banned away, so this is what you uh, what you get if you're Demon Slayers here. You elect to leave Gangplank open, and Luna call your bluff on it. They say, yep, we're quite happy to take this into whatever matchup you want. Uh, you can pick the Orn, or you can pick something uh, to counter me, but I'm confident with this pick. Yeah, and that confidence certainly well earned as we saw last game. The Kennen is also a lane bully and can look to go toe to toe with that gangplank. Not something that we see a lot of played from Zol, at least, but is a champion that technically at his default will be able to at least farm from a safer range and does bring that team fight ultimate to to match and even sometimes overtake the utility of gangplanks. Yeah, I, th I think that the Kennen pick here makes a lot of sense. It also makes sense as to why they left Gangplank open, uh, because they have this sort of, I'll say, counter with loose quotation marks prepared. Um, because whilst I think that, yes, Kennen is going to do significantly better in the early game, um, I think it's going to do you know wonders on the top side of the map. And we really shouldn't see as nearly as much hemorrh hemorrhaging coming through, and the Gangplank won't have a nearly as easy time farming up um, if he does elect to get a cull again. Um, I think that later on, just, just Gangplank really does do wonders versus uh, any team comp. And Kennen, whilst I, uh, in isolation, think that Kennen's actually a really strong pick, really good team fighter, I think that versus Ezreal and versus Bard, it becomes really difficult for him to navigate team fights specifically because Ezreal has the arcane shift, Bard has that tunnel to get multiple members away as well, also has the tempered fate so that he can, you know, stop some TPs coming through, maybe makes it really easy to, to land a tempered fate on a teleport or even just cosmic binding it as well. You know, if he's trying to find these nice flanks, Bard is really good at stopping those from happening. Yeah, and certainly we saw those tempered fates be super impactful in our first game, as well as even the gangplank ultimate for disengage, honestly. And speaking of, there's not a whole lot of engage for either side here. Camille could be a, an easy fix to that, though, which means that where Kennen is going is now a big question mark. Indeed. Uh that's that's a spicy one. I think that just that just means it's canon mid. It must do. Um short of seeing random Camille mid lane, which it has happened, um, but blind picking Camille <laughs> mid lane isn't typically what we go for. I think I think this is really bad from Demon Slayers here. Showing so early at least that their their mid laner, whilst they've still not got the what well, whilst they say that they've got Kennen uh, as a counter pick, unless one of these picks goes support for for Demon Slayers, this is this is uh, not how you use red side effectively. I'll say, because they they they've got 
their support, supposedly, to still lock in, right? Um, and mm-hmm. they've seen Bard for the past two phases of their picks. Bard got locked in B2. They've had red 3 and red 4 to elect for a support, and instead they're going to save it for red 5. Camille's not a highly prized mid lane or top lane pick, nor is Kennen for that matter. So I think that the order in which they've elected to pick their champions has really given uh, Luna a, a, an advantage just to know what's going to go on, what's going where. The only real question marks are going to be around those solo lanes, and I think that is fairly obvious to uh, to me at least. It seems that it should just be Kennen mid lane with Camille as a uh, as the top laner, but we'll have to see with the the picks here. Okay, I'm happy then. I, 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 I yeah, am yeah, less yeah. I am less infuriated by the picks. Uh, Kennen support is where I think this is going to go. I hope at least it's Kennen support and not not Syndra. But yeah, uh, actually nice nice flex from from DS here. Yeah, could could be could be that Camille support. You know, it, it, uh, a flavor <laughs> I don't of think old I do. still technically there. Um, but importantly, on the side of Omega Gaming Lunar, they did end up grabbing that Zach that we saw banned away in game one. And when whenever I see something picked up that has was banned in a previous game because they've chosen, you know, that they needed because the because they needed to ban something else that. I'm looking for that pick to to be what the game becomes about. Uh, now that we see the Gangplank, it should have automatic pressure on the map as well. Um, Zach will be enabled greatly to be able to make plays, and that is what that is what I'd be looking for from OGN to to be able to make this game about. Oh my gosh, Zach is everywhere because he is one of the junglers that has the potential to show up in any lane. He definitely does, and I think that for Zach in particular in this composition, um, he he's probably going to be focusing the mid lane quite heavily because Syndra, an immobile mid laner, you know, you can talk about Syndra being immobile and use the scatter of the week all you like, but ganking a mid laner is something that Zach exceeds at uh, incredibly well, and when that mid laner is immobile as well, it becomes even easier for for him to do so. So, I'd look to him to maybe try and burn a flash early on. And then just really allow a snowball to come through because I think through this mid lane they can Luna can just find a win win condition immediately because yes Cassiopeia is uh, an incre- one Cassiopeia is an incredibly strong support uh, not support rather mid laner incredibly strong late mm-hmm. game scaling carry is what I want to say don't know where I went with support for um, so if they're able to facilitate a snowball in the mid lane early on this game can just snowball once again out of control. Yeah, and Cassiopeia certainly, like you said, is somebody who can take over the game and can even still continue to deny things like the Camille and Kennen that do want to be jumping in onto you. We see a lot of that denial from Omega Gaming Lunar into what Demon Slayer's composition, in my opinion, seems to want to go for. Everybody with the exception of Aphelios wants to be walking at you. Yeah, there's a lot of sort of forward motion, we'll say, from the composition um, that they that they've drafted. I think that Syndra also cuts back quite well a little bit. Um, not you know incredibly well. Isn't isn't as adept as this Cassio, for example, with the with the move speed that the Cassio will get. But there's a, there's a little bit of potential for for Syndra to play on the back foot. We'll say. Um, but mm. I think overall, finding engages for Luna once again should be really easy. They've got a lot of setup with the Bard with the Zac. If they want to try and set up for some five versus fives, if we make it to a late game scenario. Um, Bard engage, Zach engage onto Aphelios, onto Syndra, these two immobile late game damage sources. Uh it's gonna be incredibly easy for Luna to go for, but I think I don't think we can uh discredit and that's uh, I'm not saying that we are at all, but Demon Slayer's mm. here, they have got they've got five damage champions here. Um they they do a lot of damage if they're left unchecked and left able to do so. That is a double edged sword because it means if you aren't ahead and if you are behind, it means that you have nothing to to frontline and it means that you all just get cut down if Luna try and run you down. Yeah, but we did see that from what we thought was Lunar last game, and they ended up finding a very nice game for themselves. And Demon Slayers this time have that same composition that we talked about, where you know you are going to be the ones with the onus on finding those flanks, finding creative ways to start fights, because you can't just run at the enemy team with zero tanks, especially into a composition that wants to kite back. But if they do find those, the rewards will be oh so mighty. Yeah, exactly. It's it's one of those things where we're once again looking at the execution of the comps to see whether or not it works out well or does not work out well. Uh, it's it's the situation in ninety nine percent of games as to if you execute well, you'll likely win the game. Uh, no surprises there. Uh, you know, there's the rare occasion where you can completely mess execute, uh, but the enemy team 
doesn't quite close out the game and then you just outscale and you win with six item Cassiopeia and Vayne or whatever. Um, but in, in this organized style play, uh, that's not typically an option. Uh, as we see, just to, to confirm, it is going to be the cannon support down on the bot side of the map. Uh, which makes this bot lane 2 versus 2 something that I'll be very interested in noticing and taking note of what is going on and how that lane sort of interacts. Because it feels to me like Kennen wants to... Want, wants to you, he's probably going to want to use his Q to poke, um, essentially. So I wouldn't be surprised if a Q max comes out from the Kennen support. Um, typically in a in lane Kennen, W max is something that happens. Also E, if you're going for AD build, but that's, that's sort of fallen by the wayside. So... I expect Kennen to be poking with his Q, trying to get some all-ins at level 6 maybe, but trying to all-in this lane again. Ezreal just super safe as a laner. Feels really difficult to all-in in Bard as well. Uh, Bard a little bit easier to go for, maybe a little bit more difficult as the game progresses because all those stuns on a shorter cooldown and the te the the magical journey, that's the one, going through walls go. and things becomes, uh, becomes more obnoxious as the game goes on. But in lane, maybe an avenue for them to punish the Bard. Yeah, and cannon support now is something that we see super frequently, and I assume not something that Scarred Rabble sees ridiculously frequently either, so do have the potential, if they have practiced this strategy, to find some surprise advantages for themselves. Maybe, you know, catching people off guard with damage numbers of things like maxed Q that you don't see super often. It is going to be potentially a very volatile lane, as opposed to what we saw last game, where it was going to be very you know, dominant lanes training back and forth. This game, a lot of question marks. We do have Ezreal Bard that we expect to be quite safe, but at the same time, into things like Kennen and Aphelios. And Aphelios, having not seen him for a while, um, we're going to have to see what sort of execution we see coming from Demon Slayers to try and pick up the advantages, or at least not be hemorrhaging disadvantages like they were last game. It is all up in the air exactly as it was last game, but with a slight edge for OGL, knowing that if they win this game, they will end up taking the series. And we'll have to find out if they can execute on that or whether Demon Slayers will take us to a game theory three right after this.
Hello everyone and welcome back to our second game of the night where we're watching Omega Gaming Lunar face off against Demon Slayers. Demon Slayers are going to be gracing us from the top side of the map with the um, five man spread here and similarly we're going to see that mirrored this game by Omega Gaming Lunar with Bard stopping off in the mid lane to make sure that his Cassiopeia is well taken care of. Yeah, I guess a Caretaker Shrine down, something that we didn't see in game number one, and, you know, he's watched back the VOD already and learned of his mistakes. He's gone and immediately picked up a a, a Shrine in the mid lane. And I'm curious, Diatropa, uh, and this is, this is no, no judgment at all, but why do you call it the top side as opposed to the red side? Oh, because because it's on top. It's uh, what, are you, what are you talking about? It's. Uh, I didn't. It's just. I, it's I didn't clear. know if you picked that up from somebody or, or anything like that. I've just never heard it be called the top side before, and I was, I, I I got perplexed the first time you said it. I mean, it made perfect sense, but I just never heard it. So I was, I was just curious uh, yeah. if it came from anywhere. It, it, I guess not. I, your no, own, not, not your not own big knowledge. brain. I am my own man. Exactly. That's understandable. Uh, something that I I want to quickly take note of, take stock of, is uh, Rabble's. Scarred Rabble here on the Bard, his rune choice, actually, as uh, we see Demon Slayers starting up the blue buff for, for good measure, uh, just in case. Um, but but <laughs> <laughs> Scarred Rabble, he's opted for the fleet footwork, which isn't um, a typical Bard keystone, at least not in my experience. Uh, mm. So often we see, so, uh, you, can, you can go for a lot of things on Bard, I will say. Um, fleet isn't something that I've seen, you know, I've seen Guardian, I've seen Domination with the uh, with the, the Electrocute, uh, Omni Stone even as well. Um, but I'm interested to see why we've gone for Fleet Footwork and how this is going to work. And maybe Zol paying a bit of early attention to this top side. Yeah, knows that Atherno was a pain last game, so we'll end up trying to shotgun him down early. We'll burn the Flash instead, but a really nice gank in that top side with just the red buff to his name ends up burning that Flash and getting Camille a really nice advantage. Yeah, it's a yeah, good hit the level two. I said smart gank, um, definitely coming out. Burns Inferno's flash mitigates a lot of his lane pressure and also opens him up to any repeat ganks. Should he try and push a little bit more aggressively and smartly as well? You know, if you see some of these early ganks go off on the top side, uh, you can maybe expect the Zac to go in or enemy enemy jungler for for that fact to go in and counter that play. As we see Rabble slightly trading aggressively, comes out on the worst end of that trade. Um, but wisely, I was going to mention, the Syndra actually placed a really important ward down on outside of mid as we see Slug going in. Yeah, Therno wasn't able to pop that barrel, so loses that trade convincingly as he is now on zero corrupting pots left and is going to be pushed under his tower. I think I think Slug could have killed there. I think he was really hesitant to go for a, go for a dive. Um, sort of suggests to me some slight unfamiliarity. Uh, Etherno was sat with sort of 120, so 120 HP right there. If he just, he had the, he even had the third part of his, or second part of his Q ready. If he flash autos, uses the Q as an auto attack reset, the true damage that comes through there, I'm almost 100% certain kills Etherno and gets himself a solo kill on the top side. But uh, either way, be that as it was, he did, didn't go for it. So Etherno is free to sort of collect himself a few minions under the turret. It's still going to be behind, uh, however due to that gank early on. Yeah, and perhaps being a little bit too cautious with his flash there could cost him a potential advantage, but at least Atherno shouldn't be finding any of his own right here as he is down a little bit of CS and is pushed under his tower with now the way pushing away from him should force him to back lest he take any more bad trades. Yeah, he's he's electing to, to actually stay because his wave would be in a really bad spot. If he bases here, then Slug CS just has the option to freeze on him and Etherno becomes uh, even more uh, in a rough spot than he was previously. These, the dangers of staying are are, are shown yeah. to him. As, uh, it looks like Slug CS was looking for the kill there, um, but the oranges, thankfully, getting Gangplank some nice sustain and getting him away as Zol could be looking for a visit into the bot side. No Graviton means no lockup, though, and he will just poke his face and his shotgun in and right back out. Yeah, uh, Rebel and Humanity knew exactly what was going on there. They do have a ward exactly where Zol was sat for a couple of seconds before he dashed over the wall and went for the gank. Uh, so they, you know, as soon as he dashes over, they immediately back off. Uh, Etherno based. He's gone back out, but a trade on the bot side. Rebel going to get himself somewhere. <laughs> Just right over <laughs> the wall into the alcove. There appears to be enough to disengage. 
as Hoshiumi did not want to chase that one any further, but a lot of damage coming out now as OGN looking for the top side does end up getting the pull back on the Slug CS and could look to make him burn his own flesh, but first blood from the Zac after flashing in himself to secure that damage means that Slug CS doesn't even get a chance to flash. Yeah, really well played from OGN and Eterno on the top side, and that is the power of actually using your recalls. Um, he... Slug CS was caught in a position where he didn't manage to push the wave entirely when Gangplank had recalled. So Eterno TP'd back in with the Doran's Blade, with the combat advantage, really uh, helping out on mid lane as well. That's going to be a flash from Ephraim. in there and Bert gets advantages everywhere on the map. Very nicely done from OGN to really make his time more valuable. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to talk about this Zach for a little bit because some very important things happened in the early game that we didn't really get to highlight. Uh, Zach got an entire full clear whilst Zol was farming up, or whilst oh, Zol went for the top lane gank um, and then came down to uh, to just farm up his bot side jungle. Uh, OGN took his entire camp, so all six camps were taken. He then also had priority in bot lane to secure the bot lane, the bot side crab, and the top side crab as well. So he reached a very early level five. Uh, with that, he was able to. Gank with the three points in Elastic Slingshot means that his engage range is so very large that the uh, that so early on the laners particularly weren't expecting it. You know, Slug CS and Efron both uh, falling uh, victim in their own way, but uh, Etheno knows he's here. Yeah, Zol dashes towards the minions though, knowing that OGN is right behind him. And it looks like that ultimate being burned from the Camille will be just that, as Etherno burned his own and actually ended up winning out in that trade. Yeah, just a quick exchange of ultimates on the top side there. Zol, importantly, was spotted out by OGN. Um, and similarly, uh, OGN was sp <laughs> spotted out by Zol. So Zol immediately backs off as soon as he sort of shows his face in the lane. Uh, they get themselves out of danger because at the minute, this top side, OGN is incredibly, uh, incredibly strong just with the level lead. He's able to find so many... Jeez, the damage already. This <coughs> this was supposed to be the counter pick, remember. Cassiopeia... Oh, Kay, uh, Camille. There we go. It was supposed to be the counter pick to this Gangplank. Yes, they came up early. They even burned Gangplank's flash early on. But OGN returned to the lane. He helped out his top laner where Zol hasn't yet been back to the top side uh, to do anything effective. And so far, at least, Etherno has showed once again his dominance on this champion. <laughs> and speaking of dominance, we're going to see Scarred Rabble trying to chase the cannon out of the jungle, keeping him from contesting that Scuttle Crab and saving it for the Zac, who has been such a key part of this early game, is the only person with a kill on the map. And it is it has been very well earned so far as he's managed to get his top laner an advantage, keep him safe, and also find the Flash of the Syndra in the mid lane, who we talked about is on that immobile champion that he could look to revisit. Yeah, exactly. It's it's definitely been a, a n nice display from OGN. And now we see him posturing on the bot side as well. I did, yeah. That fight in the jungle, in the river, really just did just make me laugh. You know, support or combat is one of my favorites. Um, where the two supports, they're, they're both just sat there with lowly amp tome each. They're not getting any gold, but they're just quite happy to start wailing on one another to try and get their gold income up. Uh, interestingly, Rabble's actually gone for the spell thief, so hitting K Kennen actually does give him some gold, whereas Jojo Loon opted for the relic shield uh, not uh, not any income comes from throwing out the poke in particular no is is going to be a very oh looks like slug cs wanting to trade back a little bit does have the nice shield from the passive to keep him healthy but the wave's still in a terrible position for him and this small cs discrepancy that was in camille's favor is slowly being made up for ogn is in this bot side and so is zol here as it looks like scarred rabble going to be a little bit caught out should get away just fine. Yeah, he gets out that magical journey doing wonders for him again. And this is the freeze that I was talking about early on. That this is the why Eterno had to try and um, push the wave. Because he didn't want this to happen to him. Uh, Slug CS mm. does look wisely push in the wave. Fortunately, he's got the team out, which makes it a little bit easier. So he's, might be able, he's able to break the freeze there. Um, means that he's able to you know push the wave back and then puts it in a position where he might be able to farm it up later on. Uh, it was as this wave has, has come through and I want to also touch on once again this mid lane matchup Gosha versus Efron. I believe other than the flash no no uh, Interference from the junglers in particular, but still a massive CS lead in the mid lane sort of nearing 20 at the minute uh, With the just isolated laning focus Level lead as well for Gosha 
the, the Cassiopeia doing incredibly well as we see. Oh, Raptum is here, and that's the ultimate from the Kennen Burn. Flash heal burned from the Ezreal will not get his bar to safety, but will earn him his own his own safety as he manages to ult back, not really hitting anyone just there. But flash burn from the Kennen as well to secure that kill. There was a lot of investment for that. And I think the hope is that they get a dragon out of it, or at least convert that one kill into something. Yeah, they're going to get the dragon, and I'm really happy with that. Signs of life here from Demon Slayers. You know, game number one, they sort of fell without a, without a trace, and it looks, you know, so far, game number two, they hadn't really done too much. Zola's actually made his presence felt now. Uh, two ganks he's done that have been noticed, and two successful ones, I'd say. You know, burning flash level one is something that you can really... Uh, take advantage of unfortunately they didn't but they go onto the bot side and that was what I was talking about in terms of the sort of early abuse that they can perform on the bard they commit cannon flash with the slicing maelstrom they uh, commit themselves the gravitum and the moonlight vigil rather from Hoshiyumi here really well played to get that set up get that kill as we see Looks a gank like in the mid lane and here is a very nice flash from the Zach will end up grabbing himself the pullback <laughs> onto the Syndra, whose demise comes very quickly afterwards. Scarred Rebel does jump into the mid lane just to try and get in on that one, but instead it will just be turret plates falling in favor of this, well, Cassiopeia, who has actually found herself quite significantly ahead. Yeah, Rebel walks in for the quick yoink on that kill. The Cosmic Binding Connects takes the kill for himself, and I believe that that timing came in seconds before the Syndra Flash was available, and... If that's so, that's really well played from Luna as this dive is coming through. Yeah, have found the ability to deny the Ken and his mobility, and the petrifying gaze should spell the demise of Graves as well. Double kill for Gosha should actually get him this entire tower now as two fall very quickly trying to cover for the Syndra. Yeah, the, looking at that on paper, it doesn't look like that dive should work, but you look at the level disparities between Gosha and Jojo Loon, and Zol in particular as well. He's got four levels on this Kennen. He's level six to level 10 right now. The base stats that he's missing compared to the stats that Cassiopeia gains uh, is, is more worth more than any gold lead at this early stage in the game as we see fight on the top side. Yeah, it looks like Slug CS ulted, but uh, the Hextech ultimatum will be spelling his own doom. As in the bot side, Jojo Luna is trying to start a fight of his own. The ultimate comes across from the Ezreal, but won't be finding anybody. OGN wants to continue the fight, though, and ends up dragging Jojo Luna back in towards safety. As now he's trying to get he's away by himself. He just can't do anything right now. Oh, we'll end up actually finding the... Aphelios there as OGN manages to live given the teleport and now Etherno is chasing down Efron here does still have the barrels available and Efron should fall here the teleport being channeled from the Camille will stun him up but the oranges will get him away and now Slug CS is going to be stunned up during under the tower here both quite low and Etherno might be able to find something we see Bard walking up but both laners will end up backing off Double solo lane committed, though, means that we see a lot falling in the mid lane, and Graves trying to make something happen in the top side against the turret the Gangplank has teleported away from. <laughs> so much action across the, in that bot side of the map there. I don't even know who came out oh. on top there, but Slugs, Slugs yes. Has nothing. He uses his hook shot and dies. Oh, okay, I think, funnily enough, despite all of that action i think the most important thing that happened happened in the mid lane gosha got two pretty much uncontested maybe even three or four waves uncontested to himself and the mid lane turret uh solo whilst plates were still available as he goes into bot side oh. he just walks straight through that aphelios damage and runs straight at the cannon almost taking down jojo loon without a care in the world now certainly can be a formidable side lane as i think she could easily 1v2 this lane right now Quite easily. Um, I, with with Petrifying Gaze available as well, I wouldn't be surprised if she was able to 1v3. Maybe if Efron's there, it becomes a little bit more difficult because uh, I think Efron's probably the only person that can guarantee a stun because if you play it if you play it well uh, on the Syndra, all you have to do is you cast a Dark Sphere and then you use the Unleashed Power immediately and then you scatter the week afterwards with all of the extra balls that are down on the floor. Makes it incredibly difficult to dodge that stun. Um, and maybe, they, maybe there's a world where they kill uh, Gosha there, but... Go shit, like, as I said. Oh, the Tempered Fate mid. Oh, yeah, finds Efron here, who should fall shortly. Scarred Rabble <laughs> ends up picking up the shutdown onto that three-kill Syndra, and so quickly, 
the advantage that I was going to bring up in the, oh, you know, Syndra did get to be 3-0, and though, very quickly, or 3-1, and ends up very quickly becoming 3-2 and and shut down by nice coordinated team play from the side of Omega Gaming Lunar. Yeah, they get themselves the kill. They pick up the shutdown real quick, and unfortunately it goes in the way of Rabble Bloodthirsty supports. What are you going to do? Uh, it does just happen. Bard in particular uh, can definitely catch you out with the base damages that he has. Um, but either way, they'll, they'll be happy to get the kill, shut down the Syndra even more. Uh, but I, again, I, I just have to highlight the Gosher is incredibly far ahead of this curve. Um, and even with how strong the Syndra is, I think that a two versus one would be uh, really easy for him. He managed to pick up another 610 gold off of the, the solo turret going down whilst plates were available, which was, uh, which was what I was trying to allude to earlier. Um, looks mm. like, though, at the minute, we've got Luna setting up for a Drake take, um, and Demon Slayers here don't look like they want to give this one up in particular too early. They are down 5k gold, but with Etherno, he's actually reset on the top side, so he's able to walk down if the team need him, but they acknowledge that Slugs yes also doesn't have TP, he's on the top side, and they feel confident enough to take the 4 versus 4 with the power that is in Gosha. As, as well they should. Etherno also having a lot of power of his own, but the stun comes in on Gosha, and he is getting quite low there. Petrifying Gaze finds nobody, and... Hoshimi isn't able to find him either, but two kills going over to the side of the Ezreal, who was completely untouched in that fight. Humanity rocketing forward and able to pick up the advantage of his own. Gosha absorbing a bunch of pressure there means the dragon goes over and nothing to be found there as Gangplank continues to farm in the top side. And this is looking a lot like game one to me. Yeah, it's definitely not looking too great right now if you're a DS fan, unfortunately. Uh, Luna, they, they, they really sort of snowballed this one away once again. Uh, is there anyone on the top side? So yeah, Slug CS doesn't have any Trinity Force components to speak of, and uh, full Trinity Force plus boots completed for Gangplank doesn't mean that he's going to be able to just auto that one straight down as it comes at him. Yeah, the, the, there's there's no world where Slug CS wins that, and I'm kind of confused as to why he goes for that fight, because... Yes, Etherno is under the turret, but he finds it really easy to get himself away. Uh, as you mentioned, yes, the, the Phage was there for the Camille, but you look at the items across the board. He's got his boots alone are pretty much uh, the same value as the Phage. Yes, 150 gold difference, blah, blah, blah. Um, but he, he's, you know, uh, essentially a full Trinity Force up on you right now. You, you don't win that with the level discrepancy as well. Uh, the GP is in an incredibly strong as well as his Cassio Piran. We saw it in that fight down there. Efron and Zol both committed all of their cooldowns to try and kill Cassiopeia, and they were unable to. And that wasn't because of a Tempered Fate or because of Summon a Heal. It's just because they don't have the damage. They're so far behind in not just items, but XP. And I talk about this a lot because it's really important, and this is a classic game highlighting it. XP, 90% of time, can mean more than items, can mean more than kills, because the base stats that come from your levels in itself are so incredibly important. And that, th this game here, the way that they committed two big cooldowns onto Gosha highlights it perfectly. Yeah, and with the almost entire team ahead on levels here, it looks like Jojo Loon should be falling quite soon. Scarred Rabble is going to get himself away from the fight, and Camille is joining it. OGN does, I believe, have passive available, but Efron has found himself on the wrong side of the fight as Humanity now has picked himself up the Iceborne Gauntlet there and is quite strong himself. We saw him pick up two, two on the bot side, but Etherno is strong himself, continuing to fight two people on the back side. Hashimi is going to potentially fall down next, but Gosha has found Camille, and that is a quick twin fangs into his doom. Finds the Aphelios as well. Jojo Loon, the last remaining member here, is going to be completely zoned off of involving himself as Rift Herald. Gosha looking for that last kill. Yeah, 10,000 gold to the good right now. Omega Gaming Luna putting on a clinic in game number two, as they did in game number one as well. Oh, this uh, this this game's looking really difficult right now for for DS. It, the the one win condition that I feel like they're always going to have is if Aphelios finds the miracle team fight. Uh, there's there's always a world and there always will be no matter how many nerfs you put into him. Where an Inf Infernum Aphelios late game can carry a team fight, but I think that the items needed to get to that point are so far away, and the way that uh, Omega Gaming Luna have been closing out the games um, have been so clinical. That I don't think they're going to be able to get there. So I think for now, just look to Luna. They're going to look to close out the game. The similar styles to they did in game number one. Probably just finding fights by slight overextensions. 
from the Demon Slayers. If they if they go a little bit too far out, expect Zack to jump on them. Expect Gosha to get in there, get involved, do the damage to kill off these targets. Because for Luna, the soul is a long way away. If they want to play for Mountain Soul, they're going to be sat here for another 15, 16 minutes. And I know that these guys don't want to do that. They just want to close out this game as soon as possible. They have an incredibly fed Cassio, incredibly fed GP. Just use your advantages and, and get yourselves ahead. Yeah, Scarred Rabble certainly using his advantages. He is just walking straight through the lane here. Slugsy is trying to find something for himself, but the Temper Fate going to deny him for even longer. OGN is here to peel for his support, and the Camille will be paying for her sins with her life here. Looks like Ezreal in a little bit of trouble himself is going to end up surviving, and Eterno has blanked the entire team, is going to just find the autos onto Hashimi and will take him down. Jojo Loon again short to follow there will be taken down by the parlay, and that is almost the that is the ace no it is almost the ace as Zol manages to survive sitting in the bot side there but it means that the base is broken and if we will see omega gaming lunar starting to claim the beginning of the end rift herald channeled that's Could just me... <laughs> that should yeah, just be game i think there is the chance for them to find a fight right here. We see no resets, and everybody's going to be right next to their Nexus, but Rift Herald is doing a lot of work. We may get to see the dance will be taken down, but the Nexus is exposed. Zol here is potentially going to fall, but Ep Ephron manages to fall first, and it is just a bloodbath in front of the Nexus here. Gosha not even going to be taken down. Is going to pop the shield right there at the end. Atherno is playing with death as... They all are, but it looks like the cannon will end up trading his life. Hoshimi takes a huge chunk of damage, and the game is well and truly over, as they will finish off these kills and finish off the game in a convincing 2-0 and zero fashion. Ooh. Really well played series from Omega Gaming Luna. Uh, they, they came up absolutely huge in that game. They came up huge in game number one as well. They kind of... They kind of turned up a little bit too much there. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that felt like there was never a shadow of a doubt that they were going to win either of these games here in game uh, in this series. No, absolutely not. I feel like really, you know, in, in, in the first part of game one, we saw signs of life, like you said, from the side of Demon Slayers, but they just weren't able to, to find the sort of post six, what I want to call late early game, uh, advantages to start the snowball where it actually ended up being huge for the side of Omega Gaming Lunar where the whatever advantages were found pre-6 didn't seem to matter. They they picked up their own in either in either micro outplays or in map movement and were able to start the snowball that we talked about that just slowly overcame in slowly overcame Demon Slayers to pilot them to a convincing victory. Yeah, and that that uh, that, that game, or that team comp rather, was uh, so adept at trying to... Oh, what has gone on here? Uh, so, sorry, there you go. So adept at collapsing onto engages. The second uh, that the Camille right there j jumped in onto Rabble to try and kill him, Zack came out from Fog of War, the Cassiopeia came out as well. Uh, really just well synergized team play from Luna, um, and Zack really... We saw why it got picked up, and we saw it used pretty much to its full effectiveness, I'd say. Yeah, that was a, that was a very convincing Zach pick. Would ban again is the, is the diagnosis there from myself. Do you have any last thoughts for us, Rooted, before we send it out? Uh, you know, I, I'm just dumbstruck. That was a, probably one of the most convincing best of threes I've ever, that I've casted. Uh, obviously <laughs> not, being, not being here for too long, but that was, that was on a, a whole nother level, I think. Yeah, that was rather rather convincing from Omega Gaming Lunar. They still will be competing, however, for at least another four week or another three weeks here, as we will have playoffs coming up after that. But the Risen Premade Unstoppable is going to be continuing, and we will see them facing up against Gusty next week. So be sure to tune in for that. But other than that, that's been all from us. Thank you so much, Rudude, for joining me. Ivan Diashova, like I said, that has been Rudude running both color and production at the same time. And we've had an excellent time cast for you guys tonight. Thank you so much, and good night.